Hello and welcome to the latest edition of the GRC and Cybersecurity Podcast. In today's episode in the Leaders and Cyber and Risk series, you have a very special guest, Claude Mandy. Hi Claude, can you first introduce yourself and tell uh, the listeners a little bit about yourself and what your company does? Hi Matt, uh, great to be here, I really appreciate the invite. So, so yes, I'm Claude Mandy and I'm almost exactly two months into a new role here at Symmetry Systems. So Symmetry Systems is a cybersecurity company with the ambitious mission of securing the world's data. Uh, so modern security teams use us to, to gain a full understanding of the cloud data stores, the data objects within those data stores, the access permissions and use an evidence-based security approach to protect their business from data breaches and other security incidents and also to meet the stringent compliance and privacy regulations. Fantastic. Uh, before we get any further, it's always good to learn a little bit about what you do outside of work so you can tell us, the listeners a little bit what you're up to outside of work you know this is a horrible question to ask anyone with young kids because <laughs> i'd love to answer with all the things i want to do like spend time with my wife and you know visit the beautiful wineries close by here in california but mostly i try my hardest not to mess up my kids too much <laughs> Um, so when I do get an opportunity to, to get away from those kids and stop being a dad, you never stop being a dad. I, I do love to read. Um, perhaps I'm a little bit of an introvert, but that reading energizes me and gets my brain thinking and re-energizes my thoughts. It also helps me think new ways, you know, of new ways for new problems or old problems that we have. And, um, you know, it's a bit of a segue, but I find particularly when I joined Gartner previously, finding time to think about problems is amazing for your mind, particularly as a, an XC. So you're always jumping from crisis to crisis and crisis and you don't have time to think about how to solve the problem you just have to solve the problem as quickly as possible fantastic so can you tell us that i know you kind of uh, mentioned it before like what is your role and give an overview like i know you mentioned you were forgotten but can you tell, tell us an overview of your career how you got to your current role as well so i'm a chief evangelist uh which is uh, a pretty flashy title for saying we're creating a new category here within symmetry systems you know, you know it's a new way approach to cyber security etc so it's not a traditional product marketing type role. I'm not here only to tell people about product. I'm here to challenge them about the way they face their current problems, get them to think about different doing ways of doing things. Part of that is looking at a data first, data centric approach to security. Um, how I got here, so I'm, I'm, as I mentioned, a previous Gartner analyst, uh, you know, kind of spent three years there thinking about these problems and kind of finding new ways to do it and writing about that, which was really uplifting. Um, I focused my coverage there on risk management, security leaders, CISOs and helping them through that. And that kind of gave me the, the groundwork to actually think about these problems and think about new ways of doing that. Before that, I was a CISO myself. So I've got the scars of implementing data leakage prevention projects, trying to understand risk management and how to convince the board to give me money to, to do the things that they should know they need to do. So I've kind of got that practical experience, the kind of analyst relationships, which I'm bringing into my current role. Fantastic. And I mean, I guess one of the things moving from, I guess, a CISO into the analyst role gives, gives you that perspective to actually say, actually, let me tackle these problems. Like you say, rather than that day-to-day -day firefighting from one thing to another, is there any like one thing that you took away from that experience of working with Gartner? Uh, there's obviously so much you learn within in Gartner, the, the ways of thinking, the, the kind of approach to actually being an individual contributor while being part of a broader team. You, you're there to challenge each other and, and think about the better ways of doing things. So it, it kind of teaches you that motivation of any feedback is good feedback because it makes the quality of your thoughts better, which I, I think is a really insightful way to, to think about just general ways of thinking. Gather feedback, think about it before you react. You know, it's not just criticism for the sake of criticism. It might come across that. So there's definitely a couple of those that come to mind. As, as lessons I've learned from my time at Gartner. Um, I think generally, you know, one of the things I've, I've realized throughout my career is you're going to pick up all these skills from doing different things. And the more you do different things and learn different perspectives, the more you can take that onto your next role, which is incredibly powerful way of you know, saying I'm a more complete leader, a more complete person because of the time I spent at these different organizations. Yeah, I guess getting to talk to all the different customers, perspectives, vendors, you, you just gather a lot of information and understand how people are addressing lots of different from problems. So could you talk me, well, talk the listeners through roughly where your company is at in size and stage of your information security program? Yeah, so we are a Series B startup. So, you know, we are a vendor. So that brings with that our focus on security right now is actually enabling the customer to transact with us, give them that comfort to do that. So what the, what that kind of approach is, we've actually turned that on our, our head. Because we're dealing with customers' most sensitive data, their actual data, um, and trying to figure out how they secure it and working through that, we've kind of, de our deployment models have changed. You know, we're not a traditional SaaS player. We deploy within the customer's cloud to, to help them give them comfort that 
they will always maintain control of their data regardless of using us or not using us. Um, but that means our security program is also very much focused on building that trust, making sure that we can demonstrate not only that we have the security program, but that we've been evidence-based certifications to support them and make that transaction easier. So yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting dynamic that does separate the vendors trying to prove that they have the right security to make it easier to trust them. And I think our model really supports that in terms of deploying within their cloud. Yeah, I can attest to that being working for a vendor myself, like the, the challenges of all the certification things that obviously that you, and there's new ones. I think that's the biggest thing of like when you're entering new markets, which is kind of the things that you sell GRC tools for, which is tackling very similar requirements. And as you get there over time, you end up with a lot of extremely similar certifications and requirements that you're doing to meet each of the markets that you're going into. So a little bit more like, who do you report to? What kind of people are in your team or you're working with? A startup, we kind of work with everyone. Uh, it's a multi multi kind of hat relationship between everyone in the organization. I report to the, the CEO. Um, so you know, my kind of role and people I interact with are pretty much everyone from product to sales. We're all there on, on solving this problem and helping our customers solve it. Uh, so that kind of drives a lot of our, our thinking, a lot of the way that we interact. So my kind of role, you know, we kind of have support with interactions with analysts at former Gartner firm, the former Gartner other PR, other analyst relationship kind of companies to, to kind of get that message out into the market. We also have like a heavy PR kind of focus, making sure that we'll be able to provide our unique insight on having this data first security strategy out to, to the world through public relations. Um, and then bringing that former Gartner kind of perspective, as well as the um, CISO perspective into our product design. You know, I've I felt the pain. I've sat on the other side of the table as a CISO. So I know what people are looking for. Let's kind of take 80% of those challenges that CISOs are going to face to our product teams and kind of correct them before they get in front of those products. Fantastic. So how do you spend your time currently and what are the key priorities that you're focused on probably over the next 12 to 18 months? Yeah, a lot of a lot of my focus is right now is about educating the market on what we do, uh, who we are, aspects like that. So, you know, when you've got a product like ours, which is transformational in the technology itself. Um, but no one knows what you do because it's a new category. And you also have competitors kind of seeing, oh, there's a lot of interest in what we call in data security post posture management. That comes with a lot of investment. But because you've got this technology that works, you have to educate the people on what there's how it works, what it does, how's it different from what they do. And unfortunately, CISOs have a lot to do already. So, you know, you, you've got to figure out a way to, to kind of get that mind share, get, get that dollar share of their budgets as well. And that's by differentiating yourselves and actually showing them you have a product that works. Fantastic. So I've heard you talk about recently this concept of data blast radius. Can you explain to listeners what you mean by that? It's a it's an interesting concept, and obviously there there are some kind of connotations with blast radius. You know, with things yeah. going on right now that might not resonate with everyone. But what it's intended to to show is, is something that we haven't previously been able to do in the security space, which is proactively be able to quantify what the impact of an incident will be, whether that's a fished credential of a user or a loss of a data store or a database. Being able to quantify how big that impact is, where it's you know. Uh, how many data stores, what confidential information is going to be impacted proactively, and then be able to make changes proactively once again to minimize that blast radius or that impacted zone of data is an incredibly powerful kind of tool, both on the cyber insurance space for measuring that at scale across an organization from a risk management perspective and kind of being able to drill down and say, actually, if we do know how many data objects or credit card pieces would be impacted, if this single person or all these people were fished at some point and lost their credentials, you can kind of dig into, you know, what's the insider threat risk that we have? What's our, our kind of risk of this credential being compromised and the impact to the organization as a result? So that's data blast radius in a, in a kind of two minute kind of summary. Yeah, it's really interesting, isn't it? It's kind of like saying, well, let's look at the data and look at like, if something was to happen to it, like how would that cascade out and what impact would it have across my organization, which is a very different way of let's just saying, let's protect everything. It's saying, actually, let's understand the crown jewels, basically, like where are they? Where do they sit? And then obviously then understanding how you protect them in the right way. Absolutely. And being able to do that with precision and accuracy so that you can say this person has way too much of that data and is a big threat. You know, no one's going to sit there and say, if this person got compromised, they could access all our data or all our crown jewels or take down this system or access this data. But no one's being able to do that with precision and accuracy. 
and that's kind of where we come in, come into this into the space yeah it's really really interesting i imagine like once you get in and you, i mean there's an education piece to understand that but me as a CISO or as a CIO going actually looking at where we've got critical information and who has access to it really identifies the people risks that you have there. Like actually we have people or users or credentials, like you say, who got like got access, right? And, and they've accrued things over a long period of time. And if, if anything was to happen to that account, we'd be in so much trouble. Doing that at scale in modern cloud environments, that's really the, the kind of challenge. You can't, as a human, unpick what an individual has access to when each object's uh, access controls is sorted at that object level, right? Being able to visualize that, pull pull that out and kind of provide these insights is incredibly powerful for CISOs and they just haven't been able to do it uh, until now. I mean, even the audit seems as well, like, I mean, um, I'm an ex-auditor, like you do a lot of access control reviews, but being able to understand, like, not just is there, there an issue with the access control, but what's the impact of that? Because a lot of the time as an auditor, you're telling me, oh, well, this person can do this, but always the vendor, not the vendor, I guess, the T would say, so what? In this case, you could go, actually, so what is this? <laughs> and that, that's a huge, huge impact you could look down the chain. So absolutely. What what are you doing at the moment that is really working? Yeah, it's it's interesting because uh, I think as an early stage startup, we re- really have to, to kind of get out there. But when when I kind of think about what's really working and where we're getting the most traction within our clients is is obviously this proactive approach, but also this see it as spending a lot more time you know right of the data breach itself you know they're they're trying to figure out what happened within the environment how did this data get get lost and as a former CISO that's where a lot of of my time got spent you know forensics trying to figure out is there any evidence to prove that I have a reportable breach or that customer data was lost bringing the forensic providers and working through that and a lot of what we can kind of show through the telemetry going backwards and forwards is what did someone actually do to the data because we're bringing that telemetry into an easy source. So uh, I think that's definitely something that's resonating at the moment uh, from, from our conversations is being able to do that quickly so that you can be a lot more transparent about what happened during an incident at the data level. Yeah, I mean, like one of the things that you kind of making me think is obviously you've got the house incident that like, as we said, protecting your assets is absolutely critical and you understand what's important. But post, especially for things like all these privacy regulations and fines that are coming out, you can very quickly identify what happened rather than this. I mean, we've all had them where we've been hacked. We don't know if anything's happened to your data. We'll be in contact with you soon for whatever provider this really could speed up the process of this is what's happened. This is if you were impacted. As a customer, that's something I would value a lot because you get those emails and you kind of just sat there hanging going, well, I hope nothing bad's happened. Yeah, I've seen so many of the kind of security teams being rolled over the coals, not because of the quality of their response and the detail that they put in, but just the, the speed that they had to deliver that. And that's because this does take time to do this investigation properly if you're doing it forensically sound. Being able to create that forensic image, but then look into telemetry to tell you what's happened is uh i think what's been missing to date to be able to do that transparent disclosure yeah it, it sounds like something that obviously is very valuable but people just probably being more worried about okay that's happened and not been thinking actually once it's happened how do we address it quicker because i think it's naive to think it's not going to happen to you now and look obviously this is about protection as well but when it does it's helping you dissect and understand it much much quicker so what are the biggest challenges you have in your role it sometimes feels like i'm repeating myself but as a small <laughs> startup you know <laughs> uh, Series B, um, there's a lot to do, right? There's a lot to do internal to the organization. We're also very customer centric. So we really want to make sure that our existing customers are getting the best experience that they, they can. But that means you know, a lot to do, many hats to wear, and uh, a lot of prioritization that needs to, to kind of go on. Should you do this or should you do that? And um, even with the customers, because we're such a powerful product, getting all these feature requests of, could you do this? It's like, yeah, we could probably do that. But is that the right thing to do? So you really need to, to kind of be quite strategic and you're, you're thinking, have your end goal in mind and work backwards and to, to, to kind of do the prioritization. So biggest challenge is prioritizing what we do as individuals and as a company. Yeah. And like I say, as someone who runs a product function, I can 
only say so, yeah i attest with that is you get lots of ideas and trying to keep on top of them and going this is the right thing for the entire product base is this the right is this a is this a distraction it can sometimes be really hard and sometimes it can be a big customer and all kinds of things are the challenges that you have so yeah go ahead i i, I did have the the other more kind of challenge that everyone's facing right so yeah i, I think what, what people are seeing and we feel it particularly because we are multi-cloud right uh, our customers want to kind of get this visibility across gcp across aws across Azure across their on-premise VMware kind of uh, stack. That's not one engineer that you're looking for. That's five different engineers who understand that. So we, we really are struggling with, I suppose, every talent we find, we have to find four of them, essentially, which is, you know, you're never going to find that perfect team member who understands all those four clouds perfectly to be able to, to kind of do that once. So we're, we're always kind of working through that. And I think what we found is you have to hire that breadth of people and you can't be locked into a single location anymore, which is one of the good things the pandemic's done for us. Yeah, I, definitely. It's one of those things of like, the wider you go, the more skills that you need to build. And it, it just makes it like, like I say, I think everyone's feeling the challenge with hiring, retaining top talent and giving them room to grow. And I guess in a company like yours, there's always lots of room to grow because it's all hands on deck. and Everyone gets to do a bit of everything that it's, it's retaining that talent, especially I know you're based in the Bay Area, which does make it even more challenging. So what are the, I guess, the biggest areas of concerns that you have, uh, I guess, into the remainder of this year and the early of next year? Yeah, obviously, there's a lot going on in the world right now. So there's a lot outside of <laughs> yeah. our little remit yeah. to be concerned about and, and work through. Um, but I, I think that the biggest concern I personally have about the industry that we live in is the amount of fun, right? The, the fear, uncertainty and doubt being spread around, um, you know, we kind of touched on a bit. Some people might see that data blast radius as a bit of FUD, you know, taking war analogies, working through that. But I, I think coming from the risk management perspective, risk has always been about uncertainty and making those big decisions. I've seen too much people just kind of go, this sky is falling. We need to, to kind of do that. do this now because otherwise the sky will fall. And the sky never falls, right? It's it's always uncertain about what's going to gonna happen. So I think sooner or later, we're going to have that chicken little kind of impact. If we keep telling everyone that your share price is going to drop and you'll die as a company and it never does, it just rebounds. And it's going to ruin our, our kind of in integrity at the, the board level. So I think we kind of need to, to kind of jump on, on this as an industry and, and find more positive ways to message. We're solving this problem, but it's a long-term problem that we need to keep investing in. Um, you know, that kind of goes in with, you know, things like we've, we've heard some analogies like data is the new uranium data is you know, a really dangerous thing that we we kind of go well let's let's kind of figure out more positive ways to to say you need to protect this uh otherwise things will happen so we've kind of got a couple of concepts like treat data like your family that we we're playing around as a, a new nuanced way of kind of approaching messaging from a, a product side yeah and it's probably like also like organizations understanding how point, important data is to them like again i guess you, you your software does this but it's like saying actually data is absolutely critical to everything we do and no, almost every business that's the case these days especially large businesses and if you don't protect that your business is at risk but it's about like you say being proportional to the risk that's there like you don't want to be saying all the time look the world's going to end the world's going to end and, and it doesn't well you look you look a bit silly and also your budget and other things will get caught right instead of going actually we've got these genuine risks in x y and z because our data here is not protected properly and if we were this was to happen this could happen then it's contextualized right i think this is always the word it's like how do we contextualize the risk to make it something meaningful to senior execs rather than just saying like you say like oh there's going to be a hack the world's going to come in it's going to affect the share price okay but how is that going to happen why i think that contextual narrative of how to, to talk to executives and support it with data and focus it on on data I, the, the two interesting concepts there of you know data centric security versus data driven security let the data tell you what you need to do but also focus on data as a primary asset that i think is really powerful concepts yeah i think especially like obviously things like fair methodologies and quantifying cyber risk in this and you apply like actually because i've always found one of the challenges with fair is like knowing all of the intricate things to get a meaningful thing out of it like not that it's not a brilliant idea but do you know the volume of records? What type of records sit on these systems when you're doing a quantification? Well, a tool like yours, running that for a cyber and 
intersecting that with that kind of information in the GRC tool, you can actually get a fairly accurate thing of what could happen if this was to be breached. Is that something you've seen any of your customers look at? We, we started to, to explore that in terms of quantifying the, the definitely the impact side of it. Um, yeah. you know, when you kind of look at that risk and quantify that, there's still the likelihood of something happening. The challenge with that is we don't provide that insight into what's the likelihood of someone being fished. And even people who do, you know, I'd challenge them. There's always going to be an attacker on the other end who has 90% of that <laughs> decision making about whether someone's going to be attacked beyond that you, you have. So uh, it's definitely a, a kind of role that we want to play, particularly in, in kind of informing some of those decisions. But our main focus is on protecting that data for, first and foremost and making quantifiable steps to reduce that risk. Fantastic. So I guess obviously a lot's happened, uh, but what lessons learned have you last uh, learned from, I guess, the pandemic in the last two years? Yeah, I, we kind of alluded to it and we kind of joked about it previously, but, uh, you know, definitely I've, in the last two years, pandemic wise i've moved internationally twice and i've done that with two very young kids um if that's not a lesson learned from anyone is don't do it don't ever do it definitely don't do it twice but uh, we're not going to be moving anytime soon um <laughs> i can imagine you've got a very maybe understanding partner about that <laughs> yeah well, you know we, we could debate who's who's to blame with uh, a lot of those <laughs> conversations but it was definitely a mutual decision so uh, we just won't make that decision again <laughs> Okay, so can you talk me through uh, what are the skills that you think that make a great information security professional? That's a, a great, great question because I, I think there's always people who are trying to look to improve their skills. And the things I've seen that really make someone stand out is when everything is flying about in the midst of an incident, they're incredibly calm. They're the calming influence on the rest of the team. They're the calming influence on, on the business. It's like, you know, we know things are, are hitting the fan, but let's kind of focus on what we can do, what's in our control and kind of try and try that. Now, some of that stuff flying around is artificially created. Businesses are always a, a fun, chaotic system to be involved in. Um, but, you know, someone who can kind of stay calm in that and, and actually sticks to their game plan and to the, their strategy. Um, so that's definitely one. Someone who's passionate about security is, I've always kind of spoken about that being something incredibly important. But I, I think that passion is one thing, but being ethically passionate, we've seen a couple of scenarios recently where you can be passionate about security, but when the, the thing is on the line, you make some pretty hard decisions so i think someone with strong ethics is, is something we really need in in the space going forward not just someone who's passionate about it yeah um, and i think just on that one i think one of the things that's interesting there is like these kind of i know when we spoke like last time was about these regulations that are making you responsible and holding people accountable we're seeing it in financial services one in uk uk smcr but it's making your fit right and proper and you understand like if your decisions have an effect on the share price you are liable i.e the that could be a financial penalty or it could be in prison. And I think making people understand that and look, should it have to get to that stage? Probably not. But I think it does make people think a lot more sensibly about their ethics when they're making decisions because it's not just the board of directors. Actually, they could be in front of a court and have to answer for the decisions they made. Yeah, I think we're going to see a lot more regulations like that sort of making sure the accountability for security is properly understood. You know, I think chief information security officers have been labeled as officers for, for so long, but they haven't really been acting or kind of empowered as, as officers to make these decisions on behalf of the organization. Sometimes they are under a, a CIO or another officer to, to kind of make those decisions. And I'd love to kind of see that kind of change so that you can actually be making these decisions with your strong ethics and your passion for doing the right thing for an organization. Yeah, I definitely agree. And it, it comes back to that that person can then be accountable for their decisions, but also independent, that they're not feeling like they're having to make a decision to, if they're an information security officer and that's the critical part of their job like they have to make sure that they're they feel that they can be honest and truthful in what they're saying rather than but i'm not saying this is always the case but you can be influenced by your boss the decisions that are they're thinking about and especially with like some of the things that we have seen in, in the last couple of weeks i think that's going to be absolutely critical going forward yeah and i, I think that comes to my last skill that i wanted to, to hit on with the, the things that make a great security professional you know being able to communicate communicate risks particularly is an incredibly powerful skill that not a lot of CISOs have had in the past or, or kind of worked on 
that uh, usually come from somewhat technical backgrounds. That's obviously changing. We've seen some great communicators and from a cybersecurity perspective emerge. But skills that everyone needs to work on is how do you communicate without resorting to fear, uncertainty, and doubt about the things that an organization needs to understand and do something about from a security perspective? Yeah, I think there's been so much focus on the technical area. But like you say, if you can't contextualize, you can't communicate that effectively of how important it is, you're not going to be successful in your role because ultimately you can't get the buy-in of the business because I I, I don't think anymore you can do this security from the side of like you need to do this you need to block this it needs to be a journey and they need to come along with you because if you can't communicate that to them you're just going to end up saying feel like a blocker to business rather than an enabler and you need to be an enabler and they understand why that's important I think so many people I mean you see it less these days but there was that whole thing of no 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 rather than going actually why do you need that why is that important how can we make sure if you are doing that it's secure and we're doing it in the right way yeah I think it comes down to communication, right? Being able to actually listen to people and then find <laughs> find Funny, that, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Here we are on a podcast talking about listening and communicating. <laughs> Yeah, talking to people, understanding their problem and working with them. I would have known that would be really <laughs> successful. So <laughs> if you could have one wish to fix insecurity, uh, what would it be? Oh, you know, there's so many things to, to fix, but I would l- love to be able to, to come back at some point and say, we solved phishing. I know it's never going to be <laughs> happened for some reason because, hey, we're never going to get rid of email, uh, but definitely being able to, to kind of solve that problem of how do we stop um, social engineering and being able to convince the human mind to do something that it really wants to do based on a story that you've told them. It just seems like that impossible problem that I'd love to solve, but I don't know how yet. So, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you, you hear the story obviously about they're kind of the unpacking of the Uber thing now was it the uh, someone pinging and pinging and pinging over again and then the WhatsApp was very clever social engineering with obviously a compromised account to get them to agree to the multi-factor authentication on their phone via a contractor and you think like you put MFA in place look there was hard-coded things after that but the reality is like people are always one of the weakest links and it's it's so hard because so many people who are just like security that's an IT problem still and it, you really have to get them in and go look we're not telling you this just to scare you but you do need to understand that you probably we should not just say yes to everything and challenge things but it's so hard to break the way people have always behaved and and make them think about look this does have an impact so oh go ahead go ahead it's a uh, definitely hard just to get rid of email as well <laughs> you know people still yeah. used to, to kind of using their email address to sign up for everything like that. Yeah. we've been talking about the death of email for many years and you know, Slack and some of those tools has done reduce the, the emphasis, but we still use email for every day. I don't know. I probably go in there. Yeah, the amount of things that it's on email. You still, even if you had a conversation on Teams, you still follow up with an email. Like it's like all the time. It's like it's just embedded in everything you do at work. So uh, one of the things we always like to ask is, uh, what other security leader would you like us to to interview on this podcast? So I had a great conversation last week uh, with a, a VP head of security at Guild Education, so Julie. Ch- I, I think she would be a absolute fabulous uh, kind of person to interview on this this podcast. So she she has quite a big remit. So it's not just focused on security, but she works quite closely with the privacy teams as well. So I think that's you know, being in the education space, bringing, bringing those two together and that understanding. I think she would be great to, to kind of hear her thoughts on. Thanks. So thank you, Claude. I really appreciate your time. It's been absolutely fantastic talking to you. Um, what we'll do is um, we'll obviously pop we'll pop your LinkedIn in the uh, description so people can reach out to you. Is there any other way that uh, the listeners can get in touch with you? I'm on Twitter as well, so easy to find at, at Claude Mandy. So they uh, can find me there. Uh, this this month I'm, I'm posting slightly sarcastic memes and gifts every day to to kind of educate people about data security. So if they want to laugh, they can try to find me on Twitter as well. But LinkedIn for the more serious conversations. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.